Well, good afternoon, everyone. We'll, uh, we'll get started. To, well, this session here is session 4A, what's on the regulator's radar? So as what seems to really now be, I think, another new normal is the uh, huge amount of regulatory change that all the funds need to, need to take hold. And there seems to be so many reviews and uh, it's occurring in superannuation, an FSI response, tax inquiries, liquidity reviews, disclosure, operational due diligence, uh, even the funding model of the regulator is now in question. So today we are very, very lucky to have uh, someone from ASIC and APRA here to answer all of your questions. Um, we have Jed Fitzpatrick, the Senior Executive Leader of Investment Managers and Superannuation at ASIC. Jed is responsible for the regulation of fund management, custodial services and non-prudential aspects of the superannuation funds. We also have, have Craig Ruitt, who's the Head of Investment Rick, RIST, sorry, at APRA. And I'll please ask Jed to come and give his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, and thank you to everyone here. It's uh, delightful to be here this afternoon, and I very much appreciate your invitation to come and speak and the opportunity for ASIC to give some uh, commentary on some of the issues that we're looking at at the moment. Um, I might start by offering some comments on the uh, financial system inquiry and the possible areas of the in some ways are, are, are general, but maybe are of interest to people in the superannuation industry. The key objective of the FSI was to consider how to best position Australia's financial system to meet Australia's evolving needs and support economic growth. And ASIC agrees with this inquiry's initial assessment that the financial system has performed well to date. We also agree that new and ongoing challenges and opportunities mean that there are elements of the system that could be improved. And today I want to touch on a few select areas that were in the financial system inquiry final, fi final report that relate to ASIC uh, and uh, have had some development since the report was published. So first of all, with regard to powers, um, ASIC supports a shift to a regulatory philosophy and regime that acknowledges different regulatory tools are needed to address different market problems, supplementing the sometimes what may be considered a one-dimensional approach of disclosure um, and, and trying to develop something that provides a, a, a regulatory response that focuses on developing a detailed understanding of specific market problems as they arise to identify the appropriate regulatory tool to address those problems and by choosing the least intervention, interventionist tool that will be effective and to try and to facilitate targeted outcomes that better address market failures. We agree there is a place for more interventionist tools that can be applied with greater speed and flexibility. Sometimes legislative processes are slow and cumbersome to deal with market problems and opportunities, and that the rapid pace of technological change and the advent of many new players are bringing, that, that this is bringing will continue to have an impact on Australian markets. Having such powers would mean that ASIC could respond to market problems more quickly and in a more targeted way as making adjustments to change continues. Now, FSI recommendation 22 um, talked about that the government should amend the law to provide ASIC with a product intervention power, and that ASIC should be equipped to take a more proactive approach to reducing the risk of significant detriment to consumers, to allow more timely, timely and targeted intervention. And this power should be used as a last resource or a preemptive measure where there is a risk of significant detriment to a class of consumers. I make these points because there were several suggestions and several, there was a whole range of areas that this power could be used to. For example, to allow amendments to marketing or disclosure material, to provide specific warnings to consumers and, and labeling or terminology changes, or to um, look at and consider whether there was a need to intervene with regard to aspects of distribution. And this was in a, a addition to comments about um, uh, capacity to ban specific products. The focus has seemed to have been very much on that last concept of, of the, the banning, uh, banning of products. And I would, I would emphasize that this uh, power, were it to be granted to ASIC, 
would merely be added to the toolkit and be part of a range of potential options and responses that we could give. And in such a regime, principle-based disclosure would remain the right tool in many cases, either on its own or in combination with other tools. And this might include measures to improve or prescribe disclosure, as has occurred over a long time in credit and more recently in the development of the uh, superannuation dashboard. I think it's important that we do get to a point where it, we're, we're not dealing with a process whereby a one-size-fits-all approach is adopted. We are looking through this uh, potential capacity to deliver a more flexible approach in our response as a regulator. I just add, a, in closing on that point, the power under the FSI recommendation would be limited to a temporary intervention for 12 months, with the, potentially for the government to extend that period, and would be subject to a judicial review mechanism and government review for the use of this power after five years. Second area is we would also welcome the inquiry support for a review of the penalty regime of the Corporations Act. As the inquiry noted in its interim reports, um, some of the laws for uh, governing the financial sector conduct and the penalties for contravening such laws are low by international standards. In contrast to other jurisdictions, maximum non-criminal penalties for corporate wrongdoing in Australia are set at fixed amounts and as a result, it may not be possible for ASIC or the courts to remove the financial benefits obtained from corporate wrongdoing in non-criminal settings, even if the maximum penalty is imposed. ASIC also cannot currently seek, seek disgorgement of profits in relation to civil contraventions. And as such, current penalties are in many cases unlikely to act as a credible deterrent against misconduct by firms. And while the inquiry recommends substantially higher penalties, it does not believe that Australia should introduce the extremely high penalties for financial firms recently seen in some overseas jurisdictions. Stronger enforcement of the current framework can reduce demands for new rules and regulations, and this is a particularly important issue for ASIC, given the breadth of its responsibilities. The main risk of the new arrangements is that they may impinge unfairly on the rights of industry participants. However, ASIC, de ASIC decisions in this area will be continue to be subject to review. The next area I'd like to touch on with regard to FSI-related issues is the user pays funding model. Uh, many of you may have seen that there was a, a release of a consultation paper on this issue last week by Treasury. At present, government only recovers a small proportion of ASIC's costs directly from industry participants through the financial institution's supervisory levels, le levies, sorry, application of fees and fees from market supervision. The absence of industry funding means ASIC's costs are not transparent to the regulated industry participants. It also exposes ASIC to an increased risk of funding cuts that are unrelated to changes in the cost of delivering on its mandate. Further resource constraints were highlighted by the Senate Economics References Committee on ASIC's performance as affecting ASIC's capacity to conduct surveillance across regulated entities. Most of the revenue collected by ASIC on behalf of government comes from annual fees paid by small proprietary companies as part of ASIC's registry business. These entities pay more than the cost of supervision. By contrast, the fees collected from large corporations, auditors, liquidators, and financial institutions amount to less than the cost of regulating them, although some of this shortfall is offset by monies government collects through the financial institution supervisory levies administered by APRA. The user phase use that pays funding model proposed by ASIC is based on recovering costs from those who engage in regulated activities and would therefore require ASIC to regularly consult on and publish our, our cost recovery methodology. This would result in greater cost transparency of ASIC's regulatory activities and services and greater cost accountability for ASIC. It would also mean that industry will be consulted more regularly and directly on ASIC's regulatory focus and activities. And finally, I'd like to just touch on um, some points that came from the FSI with regards to uh, retirement and superannuation. And ASIC's role in regulating retirement income products primar primarily currently relates to the adequacy of product disclosure documentation, marketing and promotional material, and through the regulation of financial advice. 
ASIC also has an increasingly important role through promoting financial literacy to ensure consumers are confident and informed in making decisions about their retirement savings. Such decisions with long-lasting consequences are often complex and include estimating retirement consumption, longevity risk and investment returns. Retirement phase decisions require a heightened level of consumer engagement. The transition from accumulation phase to the deaccumulation phase necessitates a transition from a compulsory saving environment with higher levels of protections to a phase that may, without default setting, may exist without default setting and, and require significant consumer engagement. Financial, while financial advice has played an important role here, the majority of people do not seek financial advice at this stage. ASIC is very interested in developments in, uh, that are proposed in this area and we'll be looking very closely at how the default arrangements, if they exist in the post-retirement phase, will work and how the transition from the accumulation phase will be uh, adapted to fit to that transition. I'd like to now move on to some of our work in super. And I'll start with uh, our uh, more recent work that we've been undertaking in the area of fees and costs. This is an area of great interest to ASIC and an area where we're endeavoring to make some improvements for consumers and superannuation members. We released our findings on fee disclosure practices of superannuation and managed investment product issuers in report 398, fee and cost disclosure, superannuation and managed investment products. Report 398 documented inconsistent fee practices and reporting that could have the effect to hinder accurate fee and cost disclosure for investors. ASIC also released information sheet 197, fee and cost disclosure requirements for superannuation trustees to try to support trustees to make consistent fee and cost disclosure. Following the initial review of fee disclosure practices, we said that we would take a number of steps to seek to address the key issues identified in our review. Two key steps are the clarification of the regulatory requirements by issuing a class order and to update our regula regulatory guidance. In regard to clarifying the regulatory requirements, ASIC has issued a class order clarifying the fee and cost disclosure requirements and for PDS and periodic statements. And these seek to address some of the main issues that were identified in uh, the report, and these being disclosure of costs of investing in interposed vehicles, disclosure of indirect costs, the removal of doubt that double counting of some costs of superannuation products is not required, and the appropriate application of the consumer advisory warning. The class order will currently apply to all PDS for superannuation and managed investment products on the 1st of January 2016. It will also apply to periodic statements that must be given for these products by the 1st of January 2017 or later. However, I would note the transition dates to the class order are likely to change and we are currently consulting industry on further clarifications for the fee disclosure requirements. I just flag a couple of areas that, in terms of the consultation, uh, where we've not necessarily been able to take forward uh, all of the points that have been put to us. Um, some of the issues raised with us during, during the consultations, while we consider it to be important, we are not making changes. For example, industry raised that there are some differences between superannuation and managed investment products disclosure requirements. And these differences are largely as a result of the stronger super reforms which are introduced after the Cooper review and are a, a, a result of a government response. Addressing these differences would require a change of policy, which is beyond the scope of ASIC's current fee disclosure work. We also note that this issue was raised by the FSI in its report to government. Other policy issues raised, which were also beyond the scope, include the disclosure requirements of the superannuation platforms and the extension of the relief to allow immaterial updates to PDSs to be done by including an update on the website. I know I'm running out of time, so I'll just quickly go to a couple of other issues in the super space to, um, just to flag. Uh, one is 29QC, the consistency requirements. The 29QC requirements mean there should be a connection between APRA's reporting regime and the disclosure regime that ASIC administers. As you may be aware, we have delayed the Section 
QC requirements until the 1st of January 2016. This delay to get was to give APRA and ASIC more time to consider the options, particularly following our industry con consultation on this topic earlier this year. We consider that consistency in superannuation disclosure is very important and it has in part been lacking to date. We are working to have a regulatory guide and relief out within uh, several weeks and we have, a, we have appreciated the feedback that we've received so far. We anticipate that our guidance and relief will limit the scope of the section to calculation to methodologies in, to particular APRA forms centred around the product dashboard. I just close off by just flagging some issues on um, our surveillance work within the superannuation sector. Just to say that uh, within ASIC we have a regular surveillance program that looks across all of the sectors. Um, we look at within the area that I'm responsible for, um, uh, have regular consideration and reviews of the uh, operations of my, uh, my responsible entities and managed investment schemes and of custodians. Superannuation trustees are obviously a core part of our remit. And we regulate, regularly undertake reviews specifically related to those trustee, so AFS licensees that operate within the superannuation sector. And more recently, these have involved assessing, assessing the trustees' level of compliance with their regulatory obligations in regards to disclosure requirements, complaints handling procedures, breach identification and reporting practices, the 29QB requirements around executive officer REM and systemic transparency and intrafund device rules. The reviews have identified a number of areas of non-compliance with key obligations which we have required the trustees to address, including issuing updated PDSs and FSGs, improving accessibility to their product dashboard and amending information in the dashboard. We also required revision of information posted on websites about investment and investment product comparisons. As part of our review work, we also asked a range of trustees questions about their interfund intrafund advice businesses, including basic questions about their advice arrangements, including the, who provides it and the type of advice that's given, what steps do trustees take to ensure that the services are not used excessively by some members to the detriment of others, and how does the trustee determine the cost and how it is bundled. We are aware that trustees offer intrafund advice on a variety of topics from transition to retirement to insurance. And in some cases, we are seeing the advice is provided by a third party rather than their trustee. And under the new intrafund advice provisions, these arrangements are permitted under the law. We are also aware that a number of trustees are considering digital or sometimes called robo advice options in an intrafund context and will continue to engage with industry as issues develop. As a result of our review work, some trustees have also agreed to update their compliance policies, procedures and registers, including conflicts, complaints, breaches, duties of it, and interests, and the production of advertising and promotional material. Our reviews highlighted a number of concerns relating to strategy issues by some trustees to gain and retain members. In particular, were concerns were identified in relation to the present presentation of rollover forms attached to product disclosure statements that may have given new members the wrong impression that they were required to roll over their existing superannuation accounts, investment options offered within superannuation form funds that were described as self-managed options, where the promotion of these investment options often gave the impression that they provided members with the same level of choice and control as an SMSF and promotional material that did not contain balanced messages about product risks and benefits. We have an existing regulatory guide, RG234, that states that advertisements for financial products should give balanced messages about the benefits and risks associated with the products. I'm over my time. I'm happy to um, take questions. I, I do recognize that I've covered off quite a bit in uh, quite a short period of time, but hopefully we have uh, the rest of the session to go through questions on any of the issues that I've raised here or any issues you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Jed. Craig, please. Thank you, Craig. Thank you. Uh, I'll just speak briefly. We don't have the same sort of list of uh, 
changes to speak of coming out of APRA right now in terms of investments. The large changes, of course, came out of the, super, uh, the stronger super process, uh, coming out of super reform, and a lot of the, the activity in relation to investments at the moment is in relation to the ongoing implementation of SPS 530. So I'll speak about a handful of issues there. Uh, if we think about the changes that SPS 530 introduced, and probably if I just step back, I would probably re-emphasise that, you know, we're a prudential regulator, so, you know, when we talk about, you know, consumer outcomes, we don't have the same sort of focus as ASIC. Our focus is very much, if you like, on the product provider. So, in a sense, we're responsible for, you know, super funds and for what they sell. Uh, that's the extent of our regulatory remit. Our responsibility doesn't extend to the actual process by which people actually enter superannuation as such. Coming out of SPS 530 and the ongoing amendments, there were a few key changes, and these are the things we continue to monitor and, and pay a great deal of attention to. There's enhanced requirements around stress testing, especially liquidity stress testing. There's the enhanced requirements on liquidity management, and there's enhanced requirements around implicitly there's enhanced requirements around due diligence, given there's a great deal of focus on implementation. And so in the last two years, and what we continue to focus on is those areas. A recent area where we have paid a great deal of attention is to the operational due diligence. And this is in acknowledgement of the fact that uh, when engaging an investment manager, it's not just about you know, the investment story, but there's a whole lot of other services underneath that need to be carried out in order for the investments to be delivered. And there's a whole lot of other factors there that need to be considered. Uh, we've looked to activity overseas and the normal practices overseas, and indeed we're basing our expectations on that. Um, I, would, I probably should also emphasise, however, that AIST has become very active in this space and has actually been doing a lot of work in terms of coordinating an industry response. Probably one comment we've even made to investment managers is that in order to make it, you know, it, it's a basic principle. If you're trying to sell something to someone, make it easy for them to buy it. And one of the things that they will need to deal with is the regulatory requirements or the expectations of their regulator. And so where you know, fund managers are able to, in effect, produce the documentation in the necessary form, where they're able to provide the story in the right way, in a sense almost provide a lot of what is needed so that super funds can actually carry out that due diligence effectively and efficiently, that can only aid their task. On liquidity, uh, certainly liquidity conditions more generally are far better than they were some years ago, but it's an area where we continue to pay attention. Uh, while conditions are much better than they were, liquidity is the ultimate digital risk, and that's why we're still very mindful to see that that's still properly monitored, properly managed. On the stress testing side, again, stress testing is a tool. I mean, we had another session earlier, I won't talk about it at great length, but again, we are seeing increasing sophistication in in terms of how stress testing is applied, but, but equally it's still something where there's a lot of room for ongoing development. And like many of these areas, it is indeed an area for ongoing development. And probably one other related area is in terms of what are termed product development and product management processes. If we look at the way the, the model continues, continues to evolve from the very traditional model where people came into a fund, they essentially were all invested into the exact same type of investment strategy, and it was just one group of members. We now see that every fund offers a range of options. And a range of product, each one of those is a product in its own right. Each one of those under SPS 530 must have an investment strategy. That strategy has to be implemented. There's got to be proper performance measurement around it, and there's got to be proper risk management around it. Probably one concept I'd introduce at this point is, a key concept coming through SPS 530 is it's about the chain of evidence. And so a, a fund CEO actually summed it up this way, and I'm not allowed to say who it is because I go to jail if I say who, which funds I go and visit, so I'll just say I thought of this. But the chain of evidence is really talking about, it's got to be really clear how decisions got made and why they got made. In many respects, the why is more important than the what. I mean, last session, again, I spoke about performance measurement. The attribution analysis is critical for explaining were returns obtained in the manner expected, were they obtained where they were expected to be obtained, where investment risks were taken, were they actually compensated? And so the chain of evidence, and this applies to all the aspects involved in developing and delivering on the investment strategy. And again, that's why, for example, due diligence, all the aspects of due diligence is, is so critical and why it's an area we're paying increasing attention to. The product development very much links back to the concept that 
you know, every product has some sort of an objective. What's the process around which that objective is going to be met? And indeed, the behaviour of the membership that you get when you launch new options can be very different to the sort of member behaviour that you had previously, and that can actually have implications. It can have implications for liquidity, and it can certainly have implications for, you know, the sorts of strategies that can actually be built. More generally in that, I'll call it product investment management space, uh, another area that we focus much more on is indeed platforms and how platforms are being constructed, and indeed the sorts of things that go on platforms. We have observed a, a change in the way platforms have been constructed since the introduction of SPS 530. Very much, again, the emphasis is on what is the reason that something exists. And I'll sort of, I was going to talk about this, but I'll come back to this one. I'll just speak about the different types of products on platforms, or, or more generally, and I use the term platform in a very broad sense. So when I'm talking about platforms here, I literally mean you give people a range of options. So it's the broader sense of the word. And of course, the exact options vary. The way we look at trustees and the way we look at the trustee obligations being carried out and the investment strategy formulation does vary based on where people sit on this continuum. So we all know that with my super, there's enhanced trustee duties, and quite reasonably. My super is, I equate it to when someone goes into the high care facility. So we decide what they eat, we decide how it gets mixed up. I won't go as far as saying we decide when we feed it to them. But, th but this is where the member places complete reliance on the trustee to correctly determine the appropriate strategy, to then implement it, and then to, to actually carry it out. So the, so the trustee is deciding Given my membership, what strategy should I have? If a life cycle strategy is decided to be appropriate, then that decision about how that life cycle strategy will be enacted is, uh, is, is, a, is a key consideration. It's a new type of product, it's got to be considered. If we then move down to sort of the single, uh, sorry, the multi-sector options, these are more products based on description, and these are products where, you know, the reasonable expectations of members become critical, and it's, again, the trustee still has the responsibility for delivering on what they've described in terms of the product features, but they're still deciding which managers, they're deciding the exact asset allocation, they're deciding on security selection if it comes down to that. So it's, it's a little bit like, you know, you can walk in and there's a range of soups perhaps that you pick from, but you're relying on it being mixed up correctly based on, you know, the, the sort of declaration it has. Once you get down into the single sector and from that side to the right, there's probably less manufacturing involved and it's getting into more of a distribution function. But it's very much about fabricating components for individuals to use. And this is how we look at it. So each of those sectors, the diversification rules still apply, but they apply within that particular category. So again, the single sector, the trustee still has that responsibility for constructing it, choosing how they build it, do they do it themselves, do they get others to do it, what components do they use? Once we're getting at the external fund manager option, as we move to the right, it's becoming less and less of what I might term a manufacturing function and more of a distribution function. But even at the EFM level, there's still a basic requirement that these things have to be true to label. They must be as described and trustees have an obligation when they offer it to make sure it is reasonable to offer for the purpose of superannuation investments. And again, the due diligence has to back that up, everything else has to back that up. But they have to have an understanding of, does this operate as described? When you get down to the individual asset, well, at that point, members are getting very specific in terms of picking individual things. The key there is, is it something that's reasonable inherently to offer? So that's how we look at the, the platforms thing. Uh, I think more generally, those who are in the previous session I was at, just explaining the sorts of things we look at. With many of the changes that have come in recently, stress testing, enhanced... Uh, Enhanced liquidity management, not so much. Certainly operational due diligence. Many of these things are relatively new. So it isn't realistic to expect, and okay, it was two years ago now, but with a new set of prudential standards, it is not realistic to expect that if things were not there, they're suddenly there perfectly the next day. That's just not a realistic proposition. It is something that develops over time. And certainly when we, you know, we look at a range of practices, at the top you've got the white, which is the best practice, which everyone aspires to. In the grey zone where most people are, we will see things that we think can potentially be done better. And of course at the bottom are the things that we simply don't consider acceptable at all. And that's when we issue requirements. So a classic example would be someone who did no stress testing would be issued with a requirement to start doing stress testing. If someone did stress testing but we thought perhaps they didn't consider 
a broad enough range of scenarios or they didn't necessarily tie it back to their particular uh, demographic profile or their particular investment strategy, uh, then that's something where that would more likely have a recommendation for them to go away and rework that and revisit the exact scale on which they're doing things. Now, I think that actually deals with most of these sorts of things I, I had down to mention, so we might open up to questions. There's one question there which is a very APRA question, so I'll answer that one. Do you think MySuper has actually delivered what APRA expected? I think the question implies that MySuper was an APRA, an APRA invention, and it wasn't. Uh, I, I think, though, it's fair to say that with MySuper and with Stronger Super generally, there has been a very strong uh, effort by trustees and very strong ongoing attention to a lot of these things. And I think what my super has done, and indeed there was some research by CIFA looking at, you know, the mindset, if you like, of trustees, and what, what has actually happened, and I have to admit I had my doubts this would actually occur personally, very much a personal view, I stress, uh, but the research by CIFA indicates that trustees have very much, they're at least giving much more thought to the fact that what they're trying to do is build a product to deliver an outcome to members. Now, you might say, but we were always doing that. Well, historically, a lot of the industry operated like an accumulation engine, where the focus was on, well, we're trying to achieve a certain rate of return, almost as, well, that's what our objective is, to just build a pot. And there's good reasons for that. Uh, whereas the evidence, certainly, the research by CIFA would certainly indicate that trustees now think much more about, you know, the reason we are doing all of this is to deliver outcomes in retirement for members. Um, having said that, there's still a huge element of peer risk. Uh, and probably one thing I should emphasise, we do get the question because there's, you know, you know that, um, you know, clearly, puristically, someone should be pursuing their objectives and not think too much about what others do, but the reality is we are in an industry where even before the recent publication started, every quarter in the Fin Review you'd have the league table. It's only natural people look at others to determine how they're performing. I think we've had the question, you know, if I pursue what I think is a rational strategy but it doesn't get the results, does that mean I get nailed on the outcomes test in a few years' time because I just didn't do well? I think the real question there is when we look at the risk control environment around investments, there is a very clear difference between a bad process and a bad outcome. So one, one clear example would be if someone made a decision two or three years ago that they wanted to pursue a risk off position because they felt markets were generally overvalued. History would tell you that decision wasn't incorrect. That does not mean, though, that that decision was the product of a, a poor process. That was a decision made at the time which appeared to be rational. So, and that's why the chain of evidence, though, is so critical, because it provides explanation for things, especially when things don't go as planned. Because one of the things that, the superannu that superannuation funds are not able to do is they are not able to guarantee outcomes because they don't control the future. So the chain of evidence is critical because it demonstrates how the trustees' duties are being carried out. It demonstrates the thinking, the planning, the strategy, and the implementation, and importantly, the risk management. Uh, 